Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to Table Talk. I'm your host, Yvette Gallinor. And today I am thrilled. In my mind, I'm doing backflips, <laughs> cartwheels, emoji cartwheels, <laughs> emoji cartwheels, pom poms, cheering. <laughs> Because we have Dr. Laura Sanger, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, welcome back to Table thank Talk. You. Thank you, thank you. It's always wonderful to be with you. It's been a hot minute. I think so. More or less, right? Yeah. It's been a few months, I want to say. I'll have to look back at the library, but... Yeah, I don't even remember. It's probably been six months, easily. Probably so. Now, I know we saw each other... Was it in, in April? April? Right. Yes. It was in April when we saw each other. I remember you came down to Florida. Yes. And we had an amazing, amazing time at ESYF and the conference that we had over there. Mm -hmm. But this time you are with us, with us next week, as a matter of fact. Yes. Yeah. You're with us next week at Faith Life Christian Ministries. Dr. Laura Sanger, ladies and gentlemen, is coming back to South Florida again. Now, let me talk a little bit about that and hand it over to you as well. So you can kind of share with the audience what you're going to be doing. How's that? Mm -hmm. Sounds so great. This is for Friday, September 20th. Um, and then the following day, uh, we're going to do something on the 21st, and then you're coming to speak at our church. You're the guest speaker at our church on the 22nd, which is Sunday. But can you talk a little bit about Friday, Saturday, and then a little bit about what you're going to share on Sunday? Yes. So I'm really excited because uh, Friday night we'll be doing an in-depth teaching on spiritual mapping. And then on Saturday, we actually get to put into practice the things that I've taught. So it's not often that I get to, you know, do prayer initiatives with the people that I'm equipping. So to be able to bring the two together is going to be incredible. And I'm, I'm excited because I know the Lord always stretches us as we step out and do these things. So we're going to be doing some reconnaissance and some informed intercession. Mm -hmm. And you'll have to come Friday to learn what that is. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's just so beautiful because, you know, when we do these types of prayer initiatives, I am always encouraged because you just see how the gifts work together in the different people that come. Um, and so mm -hmm. We're going to be equipped and then step out and practice those things. And then on Sunday, I am very excited to be at your church and I'm going to be speaking on distinguishing between the wheat and the tares. Mm. Um, so the Lord is developing that message even as we speak. Mm. So I'm excited for that as well. That's so wonderful. I cannot wait. Our church has been praying and we have been announcing this for months on end. Uh, we created a link or two links, I should say. Uh, it's on your social media. It's on my social media. We'll include it uh, here in, in this table talk as well on the description in the bottom. But it's for people who want to register for the Friday um, training as well as the Saturday walk. And then also it, we have a separate registration for those that want to join us on Sunday just so we can get an idea of how many folks are actually coming to that. But we've we've had a a pretty good, pretty good registration so far on all three ends. So fantastic. Looking really forward to that. And I just know that the Holy Spirit's going to just wow us. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I can't wait. Yes. I love it when he does that. Amen. Amen. So um, again, if anybody wants to attend, we'll have the, the registered link uh, below, but um. I was thinking about this before our talk today, and I texted you about it the other day, but a year ago, this month, matter of fact, in just a few days from now, we were in Greece one year ago. Can you believe that? That's amazing. Yeah. Oh, that trip was <laughs> just remarkable. <laughs> Wasn't it? Wasn't yeah. it a trip of a lifetime? And then you had the opportunity to like continue your footsteps of Paul trip. I did. Yes. So. In Rome and in Spain, that was 
it just, I have learned so much from yeah. just being in these locations where Paul was. Um, it just has really impacted me deeply. So yeah. yeah. In fact, as we get into the Olympics, talking about the Olympics today, um, mm. you know, I'll mention, I mean, Greece is the birthplace of the Olympics. So right. we'll talk quite a bit about Greece and the Greek gods and yep. um, Athens and those types of things. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I remember us driving by with our big bus yes. by the, uh, where, where it all kind of like, wow, it, it was a wow moment. For sure. Yeah. I saw the Olympics there. Um, you recently wrote an eye-opening article, and I, I always look forward to those articles that you write. Um, I always put a little star in my emails just because I want to make sure not to bypass that. I get so many emails during the day, but okay. when I see yours, I always put a star on it because I want to be sure to read it at length and uh, study up on it and everything. But you wrote recently about the roots of the Olympics. And mm -hmm. that's kind of like what we're going to be talking about today. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, just, just about everyone saw the opening and closing ceremony of the recent Olympics. Right. And um, we've seen how the Olympics have gotten spiritually darker through the years. Haven't you noticed mm -hmm. that? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's like the the opening ceremonies are weird and they just do all sorts of weird stuff. Right. Strange. Um, and 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 we could tell that, uh, you know, spiritually discerning mm -hmm. that there there's a lot of. Um, there's a lot of spiritual connotation there and it's not for Absolutely. good. Right. 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 So most people don't really realize Dr. Laura, the implications of watching or maybe participating in certain programs or activities. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and you're, you're pretty well versed on these topics. Um, can you inform our viewers? What are the spiritual roots of the Olympics? And let's, let's just try to develop that conversation so that people will be aware what's going on here. Yeah. And I think, like you said, I mean, the Paris Olympics, I think opened millions of people's eyes to the truth that the Olympic ceremonies are actually pagan ceremonies. You know, they're honoring the false gods, the Olympian gods to be yeah. exact. And, you know, the, oh my goodness, I didn't watch um, either the opening or closing ceremonies because I was in Europe at the time. Um, and so I didn't see them. I was thankful I didn't see them. Yeah. Um, but I have watched clips of some of the highlights, you know, especially as I was doing research for my article. Well, you know, I think those that tuned in to the opening ceremonies were probably stunned by the grotesque display of debauchery mm -hmm. and then this mockery of Jesus last supper. And then, as you say, you know, the closing ceremonies weren't any better. They just continued right. like the spiritual, dark, twisted display of false worship. And I do believe that, um, and it's not just me, but, you know, people with discerning eyes, like you're saying, mm. are able to look at these ceremonies and recognize, you know, there's so many layers of spiritual darkness and they're programming events, they're programming mind control, um, yeah. you know, SRA type of programming. And so I want to highlight one of the layers of spiritual darkness that was displayed, especially in the closing ceremonies. Um, I believe there was this pain of homage to the transmutation of humanity. So what I mean by that is, you know, there was this homage to alchemical transmutations. So what you saw in the closing ceremonies and, and also in the opening, but I'm thinking more of the closing ceremonies, there was this focus on the golden voyager. And then you had um, the mask, masked or faceless torchbearer, along with um, this human, this woman who was dressed in like this silver robotic looking armor. Yeah. Well, at one point in the closing ceremonies, all three of them came together. And this was really paying homage to the transmutation of humanity. So what they were communicating is we need to transform from a faceless human to a robotic human to a golden entity. Hmm. And one of the things that I do in my book, The Roots of the Federal Reserve, is I actually discuss the transmutation of 
or what happens in alchemy. And so the primary goal of alchemy is essentially divinization, which means this transformation from a human being to a divine being. And the basic tenets of alchemy are thought to have been written on what's called the Emerald Tablet. And this was written by Hermes Tresmegistus. Well, the Hermetic Law, you might be familiar with it. It's that which is below is like that which is above. And that which is above is like that which is below. Mm -hmm. That kind of summarizes the knowledge that's written on these tablets is what you know they, they tell us. Mm -hmm. Well, what's interesting is you know the secrets that are written on this tablet are said to contain seven steps of transformation to obtain the Philosopher's Stone. And, you know, with most mystic philosophies, you know, alchemy is rich in symbolism. And so what you have is, it's, you know, these alchemists, it's long been their pursuit to discover the philosopher's stone. Well, this isn't a tangible stone. This is a magical substance that's obtained through wisdom that can only be achieved through the highest levels of um, enlightenment. And so what it's believed in alchemy is that this wisdom then gives the power to transmute uh, decaying physical beings into immor immortal beings. So then you have, as a representation, this transmutation between lead to gold. Um, and base metals like lead are seen to be impure and immature in development, whereas with gold, they see it as pure and kind of the highest level of development. And so you know, alchemists believe that gold is associated with the perfection of all matter. Hmm. Well, that's why gold is such a prominent symbol in alchemy. So hmm. that's what um, one layer of false worship and um, spiritual darkness that was conveyed in the closing ceremonies. And certainly, you know, we know that with the Olympics, they exalt those people who win the gold medal. And this ties into the spiritual roots of the Olympics. So kind of thinking about the history of the Olympics, um, the first record of the Olympic Games dates back to 776 BC. Right. Um, but there's some indication that it actually, the Olympics began prior to that, but the first record was in 776 BC. And the ancient games, um, they were held in honor of Zeus, who was, you know, the preeminent god of the Greek pantheon. Well, athletes and spectators, they not only engaged in the athletic co competition, but what they did is they made pilgrimage to Altus, which was the sacred grove in Olympia, and that was dedicated to the worship of Zeus. Now, the Greek name for Olympia actually means mountain of the gods. So this had long been an area that was established as false worship. So in the ancient Greek culture, they had um, the Olympian gods. So there were 12 gods and goddesses that made up the Olympian gods, and they held council on Mount Olympus. And they were said to be you know, some of the most powerful of the Greek gods. So I thought what I'd do is just kind of run through these 12 gods and goddesses, and then just give a high level overview of what they were known for, mm -hmm. because we'll see how some of these were in fact honored during the Paris Olympics. Mm -hmm. So first of all, there's Zeus. Zeus is God of lightning and thunder, and he was the ruler of Mount Olympus. Then Poseidon, God of the sea, water, and storms. Mm -hmm. You have Hermes, who was the messenger of the gods. He was known for speed, and he was God of travel and commerce. And then there's Aphrodite, the goddess of love, pleasure, passion, and beauty. Apollo was the god of sun, light, music, poetry, arts, and medicine. And um, I'll tie in how Apollo was um, honored during the lighting of the torch ceremony. Mm. Then Ares, the god of war, bloodthirst, and slaughter. Have Athena, goddess of wisdom. Artemis, goddess of the hunt, wilderness, virginity, and fertility. Demeter, goddess of harvest and agriculture. Then Hera is the goddess of marriage, women, childbirth, and family. Dionysus, god of the wine, festivity, ecstasy, and madness. Now, Dionysus was honored in the opening ceremonies, and 
um, it was he was represented by the naked man that was painted in blue. And that was during the mockery of uh, Jesus Last Supper. And then the finally you have Hef, uh, Hephaestus, and that was God of the Forge and Craftsman. So these are all the Olympian gods. Now, the first Olympic Games, um, or, or the first few, only had one event, and that was running. But as soon as the Spartans became involved, you know, they had all sorts of events that were added. And then in 632 BC, the Olympics were expanded to five days of competition. Then at the end, the victors were actually glorified alongside the Olympian gods. So you would have statues that were made of the Olympians. Well, what's interesting in preparation for the games, uh, you would have the priests that resided in Olympia. They would carry out sacrifices at 69 altars, and they would do that every month of every year leading up to the Olympics. Then they would give daily libations of wine as an offering to Zeus. Then days before the games actually began, the organizing officials, the athletes and the trainers, they made the 58 kilometer journey along the sacred way from Elise to Altus. And along their journey, they would make sacrifices of pigs and do other sorts of ritual ceremonies. Well, once the Olympic Games started, you know, the opening ceremonies, uh, what happened is they would swear in um, the competitors and the judges, and they would um, take oaths before the altar of Zeus. Then prayers and sacrifices were offered up. Then the athletes would swear an oath on the flesh of a pig not to sin against the Olympic Games. Then you had, you know, oracles would be consulted, um, you know, for false prophetic words. You would have um, philosophers, you know, they would be orating. You'd have poets reciting their poetry. So it really became kind of this prominent event in Greek culture. Well, then during the Olympic Games, um, you know, those that were victors, they would parade around Altus. Um, victory hymns would be sung. Then they would sacrifice a hundred oxen at the altar of Zeus, have this huge feast. And then finally, the victors from all the athletic competition, they would make procession to the temple of Zeus and they would be crowned with a wreath of olives from the sacred grove of Altus. And then, of course, music always accompanied these ceremonies. And then it was thought that Nike, who was victory personified, would be present at these ceremonies and thank offerings. So those are, you know, the rituals of the ancient games. Well, many of those rituals and traditions have been carried into the modern Olympic games. And of course, that spreads the spirit of the Olympics worldwide and definitely, um, you know, can invite that spirit to the host city. Hmm. So um, one of the things, you know, the spirit of the Olympics is also referred to as Olympism. It's referred to as the force or the ideal. And it's a real spirit. You know, even the founders of the Olympics and participants acknowledge this. In fact, there's a historian and anthropologist, anthropologist his name is um, John McClune, and he is from the University of Chicago. And I'll read a quote. He says this, each Olympic Games is a great rite of passage in which millions and millions of people are, so to speak, taken on a voyage away from their routine and daily lives through a special time and space and then returned. Some, like the athletes who are now Olympians, are changed permanently by this voyage. Well, I think he chooses some very interesting language because he's describing this Olympic ritual. And how he describes it is akin to astral projection, which is the ability for the soul to leave the body and travel through different realms, time, and space. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing that, um, you know, is highlighted by the Olympics is it's rooted in a spirit of humanism. Mm -hmm. Now, humanism is the belief that man is not sinful, merely just imperfect. And so man can redeem himself through good works. I think this, the 
Olympics are also rooted in the worship of sport and body, as well as, you know, the Antichrist proclamation of peace. And so it's really important for those who have participated in the Olympics, and that would include certainly the athletes, it would include trainers, um, you know, coaches, judges, officials, organizers, volunteers, spectators, even, you know, those in person, but also those who watch via television. I think it's important for any of us that have participated that we need to pray and cleanse ourselves from the spirits that are transferred while uh, participating in those, in that type of an event. And it's what's important to understand is that, you know, these Olympic games are actually a form of worship to the Olympian gods, but I'll pause there. Cause that was a mouthful in case you want to interject. <laughs> no, my brain is going like a thousand miles an hour. Cause I would love to unpack all of that, but we would be here forever. But some of the things that pop into my mind, or first of all, the, the 12 uh, Greek gods, I know that they go by different names, depending on the region. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you've got Rome, Rome would call, for example, Athena, different, a different name. And the, the one that is really well educated and versed in that is uh, uh, Derek Gilbert, uh, our friend Derek Gilbert. And, uh, and he's talked about it at, at length in some of his books. But so I want to understand, I want people to understand that mm -hmm. too. But what would you say? to someone that's listening to this, maybe even for the first time, and they're saying, you know, what are you talking about? These are myths. And I just mm -hmm. want to be entertained with watching the Olympics. How, wh how can that be? How can that be bad for me? Kind of, I mean, I'm just kind of like phrasing a question of someone that might be watching this and is thrown back, you know, with the topic that we're talking about today. So how, how would you answer that? Well, it's a common question for sure. And I think, you know, what happens, um, you know, especially after the Paris Olympics, for example, the opening and closing ceremonies, yeah. there was outrage from yeah all sorts of angles about um, the mockery of Jesus' yeah. last supper. Even non-religious people were outraged. Did right. Did you notice that? Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, that's, brash in your face example of the spiritual roots that are behind that. Now, of course, you know, those who put together or um, designed the, the opening ceremonies said, oh, well, that was never our intention. This right. really was a depiction of Dion uh, Dionysus um, supper. And, you know, it was an ancient or not an ancient painting, but another painting. Right. And that's true as well, but there are layers and layers of intention that go into these sorts of things. So um, what's interesting is, you know, somebody could say, well, these are just myths. This is Greek mythology. These gods aren't real, but there are spirits that are empowered through the mythology. So if you even just think, okay, these gods aren't real you can see the manifestation of them mm -hmm. in plain sight. Yeah. So I did not watch the opening ceremonies. Like mm -hmm. I said, I didn't watch the closing ceremonies. I only watched small segments. Mm -hmm. I could barely tolerate mm -hmm. the segment in the opening ceremonies where um, there were transgender people um, at a table. I, I believe there was even a child present. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And here is this naked man painted in blue um, in the center of the table. Yeah. Well, when he comes out, then there is this sexual ecstasy that begins to unfold. And you can see it in the movement of the other people that are present, mm -hmm. you know, these, these transgender folks. Well, that's a manifestation of Dionysus. Dionysus is God of wine, festivity, ecstasy, and madness. 
Hmm. And so you saw it manifest right before your eyes. And that's because the spiritual darkness behind that. So it's like they open a door and that spirit comes in. And that's why, again, it's so important to cleanse ourselves um, from even seeing that. Right. Because by seeing it, we didn't know that that was going to be, I mean, for those who watched it live, they had no idea that was going to be on display. And then boom, it's right there in their face. Well, unfortunately, that op can open a door to it then affecting each an individual person that saw that. Another example is, um, I'll just share personally, I um, watched a seven minute segment of the closing ceremonies. Um, and I, because I was researching for my article, I wanted to see the segment about the golden voyager. And, mm -hmm. and this is the segment that allowed me to discern they paid homage to the transmuta transmutation of humanity. So anyways, I start, before I start watching this segment on my phone, um, I pray and I was like, Lord, just please protect me yeah. as I watch this. Well, um, I realized I need to step up my game because the moment I started watching it, the music that they were playing and the frequencies that were coming through that music immediately affected my body. I was having visceral um, experiences in my body that I was like, what is happening? And I, I finished watching this segment and then um, Tom and Zachariah came home and they were out of a youth Bible study. And I was super excited to hear how it went. I got distracted. It was bedtime. I went to bed without praying Mm. cleansing over myself from what my eye gates just saw gotcha. and my ears, my ear gates. Yes. I get attacked in the night, um, from a dream and the golden voyager, um, is in my dream and attacks me. Wow. And so I have to do spiritual warfare in my dream. I wake up and the Lord's like, you did not cleanse yourself. And so I, I then begin asking the Lord, okay, where, where do I have an open door in my life that, I mean, aside from my eye gate and ear gate, seeing those things, is there an open door in my life that would, um, allow this to, to take place? So I'm, I'm constantly asking that of the Lord, because I want to go through the a process, this process of sanctification and cleansing. I want to get mixture out of my life. Yeah. So, um, the Lord reminded me that, um, how important the Olympics were in my life at one time, I was a competitive figure skater from age six to 13. And it was my dream to make it to the Olympics. In fact, um, I was, the plan was I was not going to go to high school. I was training for the Olympics. I was going to skate eight hours a day. I already had sponsors and I was really good. I finished first, second, or third in every competition I was in, except for my last two, because I had lost my love for the sport. My coach was verbally abusive and mm -hmm. that's why I ended up quitting, but I never let go of that goal of making it to the Olympics. So then I go into high school. I play three sports in high school. I go to college. I'm on the, the rowing team in college. And I'm, I'm constantly like, can I, can I make it to the Olympics still? Well, when I got older and I realized, okay, you know, I'm past my prime as an athlete, I discovered curling and I thought, oh, they're older. Maybe I can still make it to the Olympics. Well, the Lord reminded me of that, that here I had this goal of always wanting to make it to the Olympics. And so I confessed that and repented and asked for forgiveness for putting the Olympics as this ideal in my life. Wow. Um, so that was the open door. And the frequencies that were released in the music during that ceremony where the golden voyager, the faceless um, torchbearer, and the woman dressed in robotic looking silver armor, when they came together, it, that was that paying homage to alchemy. The music was so creepy and it 
it literally affected me. Um, so does that answer your question? Yeah, it answers not only not only my question, I'm sure it answers a lot of people's question because if you think about it, you know, we live in a time where um, I I believe in, we've talked about this many times. I know that you've been on the show several times and you talked, you've talked about it, but there's this programming taking place and mm -hmm. we're, you know, we're so used to seeing the things that we're seeing on a television screen, on our phones, tablets, what have you. We're so used to hearing the same, whether it's rhetoric, news, whatever it's, it, we're, we're almost like, um, we're, we're immune to that and, mm -hmm. and we're not paying attention spiritually speaking. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that you bring a lot to the table because, you know, we might think, oh, you know, I'm a Christian. I'm good. I go to church every Sunday. I read my Bible. I pray to the Lord. And that's all great. Um, but there's much more to that. I believe that God, God wants us in a place where anything that anything or everything that might be like you call it mixture. I, and I love how you mentioned that a lot last time that we were together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and that mixture is not something that God wants for his bride. He doesn't right. want that for his church. So, and I know that we're kind of like, you know, talking about several things here, but it all comes down this, to the same topic that we're talking about. Um, but you bring, you bring a lot to light when it comes to that, especially with, you know, this whole thing, you had a dream. I mean, what are the chances that you had a dream that's that very same night? I mean, just because you watch something doesn't necessarily mean that same night you're going to have a dream about it. So mm -hmm. God was really knocking at the heart at, uh, at, at your at the heart at the door of your heart mm -hmm. to bring something to light. And I and I want to say that that I think mm -hmm. would answer the question to a lot of people when it comes to you know things that they may be dabbling into or that they may be open opening themselves mm -hmm. to be that a an innocent program or whatever it might be you know we we have to be in tune with the holy spirit and allow the holy spirit to to show us if there be anything that god doesn't want us to participate in so that yes. that we could pray against that and ask for forgiveness right yes absolutely yes so um wow yeah, I could go on that first point for a long time here, but uh, you mm -hmm. you were going to say what what are the Olympic Games of you said you said that they're a form of worship to the Olympic gods. You want to go into that a little bit for us? Yes, yeah. So you know, thinking back to the ancient Greek culture, you know, they esteemed physical perfection. The Greeks built gymnasiums, as an example, you know, to develop boys into these muscular specimens. And that was because the Greeks believed that athletic competition was actually pleasing to the gods. Yeah. So these ancient games became a form of worship to the Olympian gods. And it is fitting that, you know, the home of the Olympic games is in Olympia, which in, in this grove, this sacred grove of Altus. And again, that was the predominant place of worship of Zeus. Well, it was, you know, this location was adorned with temples, with halls, statues, you know, commemorating victories of not only athletic achievement, but also military achievement. So, you know, with the Greeks, they incorporated sport into their worship because they believed that physical perfection approximated the gods. And then for, you know, about a millennium, the Olympic Games were held every four years. So between 776 BC to 393 AD, and they were officially ended by Roman Emperor um, Theodosius. And that's because he, he disapproved of the pagan ceremonies. Yeah. Well, then what's interesting is you see archaeological um, evidence that in the fourth century AD, the Olympic stadium um, and the sacred sites were destroyed by natural forces. So you have two major earthquakes that happened and they toppled the sanctuary, you know, columns fell, walls shattered. Then um, a river burst its banks and it flooded the gymnasium and it never returned to its normal course. That's amazing. 
then you have, I know, then you have like these winter storms that brought like a, a lot of flooding, um, rocks, you know, would, would move about and, um, cover up things. And so the sanctuary was washed out. The hippodrome was flooded and what was left behind was several meters of silt so much so that, you know, the sanctuary, the location of it at least became forgotten. Well, then you have in the modern Olympics, um, they were revived by a Frenchman in 1894. His name was Pierre du Coubertin. And the first modern games was in Athens. And that's the stadium we saw. That was um, from 1896. So that was the, the first Olympics for the modern Olympic games. Well, Coubertin, what he did is he aspired to institute this educational program in France that approximated the Greece or the Greek ideal of the balance of development of body and mind. And so, you know, his determination, his organizational genius became the impetus for the modern Olympic movement. Well, he was asked, uh, you know, why did you reinstate the modern Olympic Games? And what he says is very telling. He says, to ennoble and strengthen sports, to assure them independence and duration, and to enable them better to fill the educational role which falls to them in the modern world. For the exaltation of the individual athlete, whose existence is necessary for the muscular activity of the community, and the prowess displayed to encourage general emulation. Okay, so here he's talking about the exaltation of the individual athlete, and that speaks to the almost godlike state that the ancient Greek Olympians would obtain. And this also, we see this continued in the modern Olympics, you know, when they exalt those who win the gold medal. Well, the other thing that's interesting is, you know, we want to learn more about the fundamental principles of the modern Olympics. And we can learn some of this by looking at the IOC charter. Now, the IOC stands for International Olympic Committee. And in one of their charters, they write this. They say Olympism, which again is another way of saying the Olympic spirit, which is very real. Olympism is a philosophy of life exalting and combining in a balanced whole the qualities of body, will, and mind. Olympism seeks to create a way of life based on the joy found in effort, the educational value of good example, and respect for universal fundamental ethical principles. So here the IOC is acknowledging that Olympism actually exalts the body, mind, and the will, and that's false worship. We also see, you know, examples of false worship in the lighting of the torch. And that's a very interesting ceremony that takes place. But I wanted to pause there in case you had more thoughts. Yeah, for sure. I, I was uh, about to ask that uh, because we see we see in the Olympics, and to be honest, I, I didn't watch the Olympics after I heard about the opening ceremony. I didn't watch the opening ceremony. I, I saw uh pictures of it on social media, mm -hmm. but I didn't actually watch it. I had put my, my, um, TV to record the Olympics because I like watching gymnastics, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's the main reason I was going to watch it. And mm -hmm. when I heard about the opening ceremony, I decided I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna watch the opening ceremony to see what, what all the, the hoopla was about. So I decided not to watch it, but I did follow up on mm -hmm. social media and stuff. But anyways, um, you know, when you, when you typically see the Olympics, you always see that, you know, lighting of the torch and it's, mm -hmm. it, it appears to be such a, a riveting moment, you know, when, uh, the lighting happens and then the person carrying the torch, the whole relay of it and, you know, wow. And it's exciting, mm -hmm. but there's gotta be a significance to that. So I, I would love for you to cover that, um, mm -hmm. in, in the next. Yeah, minutes. absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, the Olympic torch, it was an important symbol in the ancient games. And that's because the Greeks believed that fire was sacred. Okay. And it comes from um, what Prometheus did. So Prometheus risked, um, you know, all, all sorts of, uh, I guess, harm that would come to him by um, stealing the flame from Mount Olympus. And he gave it to man. 
And according to Greek mythology, you know, Prometheus paid a heavy price. So he was chained to a mountain and it was said that an eagle would feast on his liver daily for eternity. And that's why the Olympic flame is burned continuously in the cauldron during the games. Well, the flame itself is lit from the rays of the sun using a parabolic mirror. And this is an honor to Apollo, one of the Olympian gods that I spoke about, because they thought they believed that Apollo was the god of light and of sun. Well, in the modern, so that's how um, the torch was lit in the ancient games. Well, in the modern Olympic games, the torch is lit in a ceremony involving women who dress like um, the ancient Greek priestesses and the rays of the sun, you know, reflected by this parabolic mirror are said to ignite the quote unquote fire from the sky. Then what happens is the high priestess is the first to receive the flame and she then offers it up like in this triumphant gesture to the sky. Then she lights the cauldron and the cauldron is carried in procession towards the ancient stadium in Olympia. And so they pass through this crypt door and they're, you know, they're walking on foot at the front of this procession are two adolescent boys. They're carrying, um, I believe they're boys. Um, they're carrying uh, olive branches and that is representative of honoring Zeus. Then the procession is um, followed by two young girls playing the flute. And so they proceed into um, the center of the Olympic stadium and they go near the starting blocks of the ancient um, games where the runners would start their race. And it's from that location that the torch is lit. Well, the, after the high priestess invokes the Olympic or the Olympian gods, she hands the first torch to a runner. That runner is accompanied by six other runners and they, um, the six runners accompany this runner that has the torch to the exit of the circle, the sacred circle of Olympia. So that's the ceremony of the lighting of the torch. Now, the torch relay, the origins of the torch relay actually go back to the Berlin games um, during the Nazi regime. So this would be in 1936. And Hitler, you know, he was an avid reader of Greek mythology because he oftentimes would compare the Nazis to the Greeks because both cultures were, you know, seeking after how to find the perfect human specimen. Mm -hmm. So what Hitler did is he used the torch relay as propaganda and he assigned Joseph Goebbels, who was, you know, the Nazi propagandist to lead the torch re relay and not lead it, but oversee it. And so Joseph Goebbels, he found ways to maximize the fanfare um, with this, this torch relay. Well, so what happens is, you know, the Olympic spirit that I've talked about, you know, it fuels humanism and it focuses on physical prowess. All of that bolstered um, Hitler's ethos of creating this superior Aryan race. And so the torch relay really became, um, it brought a lot of attention to Hitler's ideologies. So when you think about like the big picture of all that I shared, you know, you can begin to see how many ways the Olympics are these pagan ceremonies really. Yeah. And that's why, I mean, it's so important that the spiritual gatekeepers of these host cities that host the Olympics, it's so important that they prepare the city and the people for when the Olympics come, because the Olympics tries to release these spirits and these gods that come with them. When, when um, you and I were discussing some of the things that we were going to talk about uh, today and, um, and we landed on the, the gatekeepers, I thought so much about us and our church. Mm -hmm. And, um, if you recall, we we've, we've had this conversation before. We were once located in um, the same city, right? But on one end of the city, where it was the entrance and the exit to the city, and now we're in the location on the opposite end, same scenario where it's the entrance and the and the exit of the city. 
And, um, and, and we've always talked about this. I mean, we've been in existence for 20, uh, going on 21 years now, 20 years in March, it was 20 years in March, this past March. And, um, we've always said we've, we're a beacon of light, you know, we're the gatekeepers, you know, in the city. I mean, Mm -hmm. we've been in this bookend, uh, Mm -hmm. for such a time as this. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's so important, Dr. Laura, because, um, one of the things that I'm really excited about when you come next week is, um, is so you can talk a little bit about that. I know you're going to be touching on, on a lot of these aspects, but, um, if I recall correctly, I think in your article on this topic, on the Olympics, you talked about Salt Lake city Mm -hmm. and when the Olympics were held in Salt Lake city Mm -hmm. and what occurred prior to Mm -hmm. the Olympics actually launching in mm-hmm. that city and what what happened after the fact like during and, and then after the fact and then i also thought about the next olympics which is in california it's going to be in california a lot of prayer for california i love my california people but i know that they need a lot of prayer yeah. and so can you talk a, a little bit more about that because how can the gatekeepers of the host city mm-hmm. and really be that in the Olympics, you know, protect the land and its people from the Olympic spirit, but also bring it to the case of, for example, Faith Life Christian Ministries, our church, right? And how Mm -hmm. we are the gatekeepers as well, and many churches alike, and many congregants and and things like that. Does that make sense that did I, Mm -hmm. did I frame that in a, in a, in an okay way? (laughs) Yes. Yeah. I know there's a lot here, so I'm trying to like (laughs) compartmentalize my thoughts. (laughs) Well, so in 2002, the, you know, Salt Lake City hosted the Winter Olympics and um, it was an incredible experience on many different levels. But what I want to talk about is just share our experience um, yeah. in in living here and, and um, being part of the hosting of the Olympics. So there was um, a, what's called the Utah Prayer Network. And it was uh, made up of the spiritual gatekeepers. So these were Christian leaders and Christian pastors of Utah. They came together for the Olympics or prior to the Olympics to form a network. And um, they were the impetus of planning many different initiatives, prayer initiatives, outreach initiatives, those types of things. And so They approached our spiritual mapping team and asked if we would write a spiritual mapping prayer brief for the Olympics because they were hosting a prayer initiative at Rice Eccles Stadium. And that was the stadium where the opening and closing ceremonies were held. This is um, on the University of Utah campus. And so we were thrilled um, to have an opportunity to right. write a spiritual mapping prayer brief. So what we did is we, you know, began doing the research, looking into the spiritual roots of the Olympics, which is much of what I just shared with you. Right. And then in our prayer brief, we, um, you know, gave the history, but then we also identified these targeted prayer points because we wanted to be able to equip intercessors to be able to pray fervently in an informed way to protect the land, the people, and all those that were visiting. Because our goal, we wanted to glorify Jesus, not the Olympian gods with the Olympics. And we saw just so many answers to prayer. It was incredibly encouraging. And I I really want to highlight how important it is, you know, to have these targeted prayer points because it equips intercessors to be able to strike at the root of the issues. And so, you know, we had this prayer gathering at Rice Eccles Stadium. And um, I remember, I don't know how many people did this of, of all those that came, but I remember we had an opportunity to pray all throughout the stadium and bless every single seat. I mean, it was incredible. Wow. And then we met in a conference room, you know, at the top of the stadium, overlooking the entire stadium. And there was well over a hundred people there. And these were, you know, the, the folks from the Utah um, games network, but then visiting ministries um, from other States, even other nations joined us. And so because we had this spiritual mapping prayer brief that had all of these targeted prayer points, it allowed us, you know, Christians from all sorts of backgrounds to come together in unity and pray that the Lord's purposes would be accomplished during the Olympics. And that's what we saw. So 
Jesus answered our prayers in so many beautiful ways. Um, you know, the, the people were blessed, the cities were blessed that hosted the different venues. In fact, um, NBC commentator Bob Costas and his closing remarks, he said this, he said, these games now have a place in Olympic history where it will be written that Salt Lake staged one of the best Winter Olympics ever held. Many say the best, which is quite a statement coming from Bob Costas. So right. I thought what I would do is I'll share just some of the prayer points, not all of them, but just some of them, and then share how God answered these prayers. Yes. So first of all, you know, we prayed for peace and protection against terrorism because this the Olympics were five months after 9-11, which we happened to be recording on 9-11. That's right. So it was five months after um, what happened on 9-11, and we were at war with Iraq. So we wanted to pray peace and protection from yeah. terrorist attempts. Then we prayed for effective evangelism for all the Christian ministries and individuals that were coming for the Olympics. We also prayed for wisdom for the Utah Games Network, these spiritual gatekeepers, um, and how they were educating, educating, visiting ministries, and how to effectively evangelize in our culture here in Utah. Right. And then we prayed um, for the distribution and um, for a good reception of what's called the Bridges Training Series. And what that does is the bridging training seminar, it um, educated people as to the best way to communicate the gospel message here in our culture. We wanted, um, you know, those visiting ministers to come in and be able to communicate the, the gospel with clarity, with respect, and with grace. Essentially, we didn't want the in-your-face, you know, turn or burn, you're going to hell <laughs> type of um, evangelist. And yeah. so they, they put together this training series and then we prayed, um, for protection and, and a blessing of peace over all the venues, over the families in those cities where the venues were held. Um, because again, we wanted, we didn't want distraction of chaos, of violence, of terrorist attacks. We wanted the message of Jesus to come forth in every way possible. Then we prayed specifically that hidden things would be brought to light. We also prayed that wherever the torch relay went, the light of Christ would shine forth and not the light of the Olympian gods. So those are just some of the prayer points, um, the answers to our prayers. So first of all, um, the security efforts for the 2002 Olympic Games were the largest of any sporting event up to to date um, in 2002. And um, it was beautiful because despite the fact that the previous Olympics that were held in um, the United States and Atlanta in 1996, there was a bomb that went off during those Olympics. Yes, so despite that, despite the fact that we were at a heightened state of terrorist threats in 2002, mm -hmm. there were no bombs, there was no terrorist um, acts, there was no violence, everyone involved in the Olympic games remained safe. So that was a huge answer to prayer. Yeah. Another answer to prayer was the evangelistic tool called more than gold was really effective. So the Utah games network developed an evangelistic campaign called more than gold. So they had banners, they had advertisements, they had merchandise, and um, there was an Olympic square uh, down in downtown Salt Lake during the Olympics. It was like four blocks by four blocks and it was fenced off. You had to have a ticket to get in. Well, that's where the metal plaza was. That's where they would have concerts. There was merchandise, shopping, restaurants, all of that. Well, um, in the Olympic square, you know, you had all these um, booths that were selling Olympic pins and you would trade pins with different people from different countries. And it really was a fun way that people engaged one another. Well, the Utah Games Network made an Olympic pin that said more than gold. And so people would buy them and they would trade them. And it actually held fairly good trading value because people were really intrigued. What is this more than gold? Well, as soon as they asked the question, 
then you can share. Well, more than gold means that our value, our worth as an individual is worth way more than gold, even a gold medal, because Jesus died on the cross for yeah. each and every one of us. And so it just opened the door for evangelism. It was an incredible thing. The other answer to prayer was that 1,200 people participated in the Bridges training seminar. And again, that was a way to train visiting Christians as to the most effective way to share the gospel message in our culture here in Utah. And it was so effective that um, visiting evangelists from both Athens and from Torino, Italy, because those were the next locations where the Olympics were going, those evangelists met with the Utah Games Network because they wanted to know how to use these principles to be able to apply them to their own culture and train people that are coming for the Olympics that were being held in their own cities. So that was really encouraging. And then another answer to our prayer is, again, there was no violence. So all of the host cities, you know, where these venues were held, um, there was peace, there was, um, you know, excitement, uh, joy. Well, the Olympic Games were served by 25,714 volunteers. Only 77 volunteers dropped out or were terminated. And that was unlike any Olympic Games. In fact, there was an article written in Newsweek by Sharon Begley, and she wrote, the host shown the last time the United States held an Olympics was in the summer of 1996 in Atlanta, and the contrast with Salt Lake City could not have been starker. Atlanta looked like a tacky flea market with wall-to-wall -wall sidewalk vendors and omnipresent in-your-face corporate logos. And then Bob Costa said, he said, these games worked because a multitude of citizens were relentlessly efficient and cheerful. Little so did he was, know. <laughs> <laughs> it was a beautiful way of um, blessing those that came by serving. Then, um, you know, we prayed again that hidden things would be brought to light where there were two major ways that this was answered. Yeah. Um, the first being the Olympic bribery scandal. Right. So leading up to the Salt Lake Games, you know, it was common practice that city officials that were wanting um, to win the bid for the Olympics to come to their city, they would bribe the IOC officials. Well, it that got exposed in Salt Lake. So prior to the games happening, it was discovered what briberies the IOC officials accepted from the Salt Lake Organizing Committee. And so it became such a scandal and, and so much got exposed that um, they had to change the way moving forward, how the Olympic bidding process works. So that was a huge answer to prayer. Corruption, you know, backroom deals got exposed and now it's much more transparent and there's no bribery involved. Then the other major thing that was near and dear to me was the judging of the figure skating competition. So it's been known for a long time that the judging of both the pairs and the ice dancing competition has been rigged. I mean, it was very mm -hmm. political. When I was training, um, you know, back in the 80s, we knew back then that both the pairs and the ice dancing competition was rigged. Wow. Well, that got exposed during the Salt Lake Olympics. So in the pairs competition, um, you know, after the short program, the Russians were in the lead. They were in first by a small margin over the Canadian pair. And during the long program, I believe the Russians skated first and they messed up twice in their program, in their long program. Then the Canadians take the ice and they skate a flawless program. I mean, it brought down the house and it was so fun to watch because they knew after their program was over that they won the gold medal. I mean, you could not have skated better. Yeah. So then they skate off the ice. They wait for their, their marks for the judges to give the marks and the judges place them in second place behind the Russians and everyone was stunned. And it created this outrage because it was so clear they were robbed of a gold medal. Wow. Well, more and more people began talking about it in the media 
And the French judge came out and admitted that she had been pressured to give the Russians the gold. And she was promised that their French ice dancing team would receive benefit if she gave the Russian pair the gold medal. And I don't know if she was the deciding vote, but by her saying that, it blew the scandal wide open. And wow. so um, I'll read a quote from the Salt Lake Tribune. It says, the scandal may also prove a stunning turning point in the history of one of the most popular sports in the Winter Olympics. This is not an end, Saleh said. Saleh and Peltier were the Canadian pair team. She said the truth still has to come out and they have to solve it. International Skating Union President Octavio Cinquanta has pledged to do just that, proposing radical changes in the scoring system for figure skating. And that's exactly what happened. If you look at how figure skating is scored now, it's scored anonymously, first of all. And um, almost right away after each maneuver, they you see the technical marks. And um, if they bobble on a, on a mark or on a... Um, uh, maneuver, you see how the judges mark them down. And so it's, it's real time. You can see it. And, and it's beautiful that as a result of the Salt Lake Olympics, what was done hidden backroom deals was brought to light and it brought forth really positive change. The other thing that happened was a few days after, um, the pairs event was finished, the Olympic committee decided to award Pelé or um, Sale and Peltier the Olympic gold medal. So you had both the Russians and the Canadians winning the Olympic gold in the pairs competition. You've never seen that before anywhere. So that was an answer to our prayers. And then finally, the torch ceremony, you know, the lighting of the torch in Olympia from the Greek priestess, um, using the the rays of the sun with a parabolic mirror that was thwarted weather prevented her from lighting the torch from the rays of the sun and she had to modify the ceremony well when you have a modified ceremony there's not the same level of empowerment that comes forth and you can think about like a marriage ceremony versus a rehearsal as an example yeah and so we were rejoicing when we found that out and then along the way the torch went out on several different occasions and when they relit the torch they did not invoke the olympian gods so by time the torch arrived in salt lake it was not attached to the invocation of the olympian gods so we considered that a major victory so those are just some of the answers to prayer. And I share that because, first of all, I want to encourage us all. You know, James 5.16 says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Yeah. And so this is an example of that. But also to encourage those who are spiritual gatekeepers. When you come together in unity, you've got these targeted prayer points that strike at the root of the issue mm -hmm. that's going on in your community. You will see turnaround. You will see breakthrough. And so I am. Um, I have the privilege of being able to uh, consult with some of the folks involved in the LA Olympics. So an athlete that's on the athletes council, and then I'm consulting with some of the lead intercessors in California, because they're already petitioning the Lord for the strategy, which is so exciting. Yes. Oh, for sure. That's exciting to know. Yeah. I didn't know that. That's wonderful. You know, Dr. Laura, I was thinking about all this when you were talking about uh, these praise reports and, uh, in recent years, too, it was um, exposed of uh, the the whole scandal, too, with, was it the doctor that was treating the... Oh, um, yes, the gymnasts. The gymnasts. Yes. So if you think about it, the prayers of you all during the Salt Lake Olympics didn't just end there. Oh, I believe that, beautiful. yeah, if you think about it, it's still... It's a trickle effect. It's mm -hmm. still reverberating. It's still, it's still in the works. It's still in the, in, you know, in the, in the answering mode, you know what I'm saying? And so, yes. um, yeah, you continue to pray, you continue to look for the strategies, for example, now when in Los Angeles, when they have the next Olympics and everything, but those prayers didn't just stop there. Mm -hmm. I believe that there's just a lot more 
to uh, to that. So that that's beautiful, beautiful. I was thinking too about, um, I don't know if you noticed, but there were a lot of Christian athletes in this Olympics. Mm -hmm. um, and from my understanding, and I don't know if, if this is incorrect, but it was my understanding that they were not allowed to display any kind of religious, um, you know, form or or I mean, I, I heard about a surfer that had like the uh, painting of Jesus on his surfboard oh, and yeah. he was told, you know, you can't use that. And and so all these things that were being said that the um, athletes couldn't display any form of religious, uh, you know, whether it was if speaking about Jesus or saying anything about the Lord. But a lot of these Christian athletes, they could care less. They were glorifying Jesus. Mm -hmm. in a bunch of aspects i saw several um posts about you know different athletes that were questioned at the end whether they got gold silver or bronze and they were glorifying glorifying jesus mm -hmm. i saw how one i think it was a runner she also um sign language jesus yes. is lord yeah. or something like that so i was blessed to see that even in the midst of all this like nonsense right. that were going was going on in the you know, in the backdrop of it all. But yes. I don't know if you saw yeah. some of that. I did. Yeah. It was encouraging. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, so you, you came out with a brand new book. I did. Yes. Very excited. It's a uh, generation hoodwinked. Yes. Oh, what a title. And then the subtitle to that is kind of similar to your Root, the Roots of the Federal Reserve, where this one says the impact of the Nephilim agenda today. Can you mm -hmm. share just a little bit about the book before we close today? Yes. Well, I'm really excited, you know, that it it got published. Um, it essentially is, it provides a pathway out of the dark caverns of mind control by exposing these deceptive narratives that have been thrust upon us. And so I believe it's a call to freedom. Um, I not only wanted to expose the fruitless deeds of darkness, but also equip people with how to break free from the strongholds um, that have been over our minds and, and things like that. So it is available on Amazon right now. It's just in um, paperback, but we are working on the ebook um, that should be out probably by the end of September. Okay. And then I am so excited. Uh, I'm I'm working with um, Brandon Weaver of, I think it's Iron Wing Studios. I have to um, I have to get my facts straight on that one, but he is going to be doing the audio. I'm going to narrate and he's going to do the audio production for the Audible book. So Wonderful. very excited for that as well. And then of course, The Roots of the Federal Reserve yeah. is available in Spanish, thanks to you and pastors, you know, uh, Marsha and Eddie Yay. and um, Pastor Ricky as well. So I'm so grateful for that. And I am, I was able to um, have some wonderful encounters with people in Spain while I was there, particularly yes. in Madrid, and was able to give some signed copies away and wow. I'm making connections with people in Guatemala as well. And so I'm just praying that, um, you know, the Spanish version, the Lord will just take it into those countries that really need it. Yes, absolutely. I know it's making a, a huge impact in many people's lives. You're going to be bringing both books to South Florida, yes. correct? So yes. for those of you that are coming to the conference on Friday or the training on Friday, I should say, and then. Um, the Sunday service will have books available too for purchase. So, and a lot of your merch as well. Yes, so yes. looking forward to that. Um, will you close us off in a prayer? I know that when you wrote your article about the Olympics, mm -hmm. um, there is a, um, uh, an example prayer there. If you could, mm -hmm. if you could pull that up and pray that over us, um, mm -hmm as, as a means of, you know, anyone out there that, um, has, you know, understood better, um, what we've been talking about today. And I think it's important for us to, uh, you said target prayer points are mm -hmm. very, very important. And I think we need to be very specific when it comes to our prayers. Yes, um, so would yes. you close us off with, with that prayer? 
Yes. And let me just share that this prayer was written by a friend of mine, Andrea Reinberg, and she is, has a ministry, a deliverance ministry. She ministers to people coming out of satanic ritual abuse, um, as well as government mind control victims. Mm -hmm. And she is um, with a ministry called Four Corners Free. And um, she's the one that wrote this. So I will, um, I will pray and, and read through this and we'll Amen. declare it together. Amen. I exalt God most high as creator of the heavens and earth and all that is in them. I declare that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven and earth and under the earth that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the father in the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who came in the flesh, I renounce and repent of all connections and activities with any other spirit, including the Olympic spirit, the Olympian gods, particularly Zeus. I renounce any unholy connection with people, places, and events that have honored false gods and the pursuit of attaining human perfection. I renounce the cauldron, the fire from the sky, the ushering in of the Antichrist and the new world order. I renounce the calling forth of demons from under the sea, the powers of the pyramid and Babylon. I renounce the worship of self and any connection to Nazi ideals of human perfection. I renounce every ritual, ceremony, incantation, or activity that would further the cause of the Antichrist. In Jesus' name, I renounce the mockery of Christianity, of the Last Supper, and of sexuality. I renounce the unholy being exalted. I renounce the release of Dionysus and the pressure to conform to the debauchery and ritualistic sexuality. I renounce the ancient Greek mindset that would stir up mob-like behavior and compel others to worship false gods. I renounce all bloodshed and madness invoked in any call to participate in occult activities in any time, space, or dimension. I reject connections to any human spirit aligned with these activities or false gods. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for separation from all of these, and I declare that I am a child of the Most High God, created in Christ Jesus for good works, and that all honor, glory, and praise belong to him alone. Amen. Amen and amen and amen. Wow. Well, we come in agreement with that prayer. Thank you, Dr. Laura. Once again, will you tell the audience where they can find your work and uh, also yes. send to your ministry? Yes. Uh, my Probably the best place to start is my website, which is no longer enslaved.com. I also have YouTube and Rumble channels um, called No Longer Enslaved. I have 41 episodes now on those. And if people want to reach out to me um, via social media, I am on Telegram and uh, Instagram under Laura Sanger 444 Hertz. So those are great ways to reach out. Awesome. Well, thank you once again for joining me. I appreciate it so much. And I can't wait for next week or we'll host you and have a blast together. <laughs> yes, I'm very excited. <laughs> so are we. So are we. Well, thank you guys for watching tonight. And I appreciate you liking, sharing and subscribing to the channel. Be sure to share it with your friends and your families. And we will be with you back again next Wednesday. God bless you and take care. Bye.